In the first episode, we talked about functions and we've seen different ways of defining functions in JavaScript. I gave you this definition that a function is a unit of computation which takes input and produces output. Today, we will not only talk about side effects and pure functions, two main uh, topics of this episode, but we will also see that we can define a function in a very unusual way as a result of diving into side effects and pure functions. So let's go ahead. So as you remember, we can define a function, let's say compute, which adds two parameters and the result is uh, pretty straightforward. If we pass three and four as arguments, we will get seven as a result. So now let's talk about side effects. This function compute, it takes those two parameters and then it adds them. If there is something else that happens while this computation is being uh, performed, for example, if there is a change that occurs in the system state or there is some effect outside of this function, it means that this thing inside the body of this function causes a side effect. Side effect has this pejorative meaning associated with it. It's for a reason. We have a computation and if they are side effects, it means that something happens which is not really related to the function itself. Function performs a, a, a computation and if this whole computation influences the external world, for example, the state of the system of your program, which is the, the set or the union of all the variables you can, you can have, or there is some things that happen on the display caused by this function or something changes somewhere else, it means it is a side effect. So let me give you some examples. The most common example is if a function prints something to the standard output, for example. So in JavaScript, we are printing something to the console. It's a side effect because this part is not related to the computation. It changes the console, which is an entity somewhere else, which displays the line. If the console is empty, for example, we will have one line. But if we invoke this function several times, the console may be long or, or short, and we are unable to tell the current state of this entity. So if you imagine the computation as uh, going from top to the bottom, like taking x and y and doing the sum of two, the side effect is something that happens recently which means that the computation carries, but at some point in the body, there is this statement that says, change something outside of me. Change the console by printing, by adding or by appending a new line to it. So that's one, of the ex or one example. If you have an object and if you define a setter, for example, let's say we have a, a class, a person, and we create an instance, and then we use the setter, which we defined here, which changes one of the fields defined uh, in that object. This is also a side effect because it changes the internal state of this object. Invoking methods on objects causes side effects. Lastly, any input output operation you are performing, for example, if you are opening a file and reading from a file or writing, writing to a file, if you are interfacing with a database, like doing queries or doing HTTP requests, all those operations are side effects because all those things change something in the system which is outside of this function. So these are just three examples, but they are, there is more if you can imagine that every time your function depends on something which is defined outside, for example, a global variable. It means that changing that variable causes a side effect because it, it is outside, because it influences the outside of the function. So let's now focus on problems related to side effects. So the first and most important one is that side effects are the primary cause of complexity in programming, in software. And it's funny because without side effects, you cannot really do much because as we said, every input output operation is a side effect. So how we can resolve that? The solution is uh, to try to control the side effects. So instead of spreading your side effects through your program in different places, so that the side effects are scattered in many functions which are defined in many places, the idea is to contain them, to control them, and to have a core which is free of side effects and then on the edges of your system have this um, 
well-defined border when you cross from functions that can cause side effects and functions that don't cause side effects so that we can somehow control this complexity. Otherwise, it's difficult to program this way. Another problem with side effects is that this is something which is added, something which is additional to the function. The function has its um, well-defined function. It, it, it does something specific. And side effects is something which is hidden inside this function. And it's not fully transparent to us. Function has its purpose, but then there is a side effects as well. So we have to be more careful when analyzing such functions, functions that contain side effects. And lastly, we haven't really talked about the function composition. I want to just mention this point because we will talk about it more in the future episodes. But if you have side effects, you are making your functions more difficult to compose. Functional programming is about using functions, is about composing them. If you have side effects, this may complicate things. Okay, so now we define side effect. And let's talk about pure functions. Pure functions are functions that produce the same output for the same input. So whenever you, you're giving something to the function and produces something, if the arguments don't change, the output won't change. That's the first condition and it cannot have side effects. So if those two conditions are fulfilled, you can call your function pure function. And if we have such function, which doesn't cause the side effects, and at the same time its invocation can be replaced by its output for given parameters, it means that the output is only influenced, is only generated from the input. In other words, the computation depends on the input and the result of the function is what generates the output of this function. So let's see some examples. A function which has an empty list of arguments, parameters, and produces a, a defined, a constant string is pure. Every time we invoke that function, it will always return the, in this example, uh, the, the hello string. But we can slightly change it. So we, we can define a parameter, the name, and a function called greet, which will append our named hello in a string. So if we execute it, we can see that it's hello Zahist. The only way for the output to change is to change the input parameter. There is nothing in the body of this function which will change the, the output and the function doesn't communicate with the external world. So we could say that this function is self-contained. It only depends on the input parameter. So another example, a more uh, interesting one, is a function which generates a date. So now whenever I invoke this function, let me just invoke it. And each time I invoke this function, the date changes. The input doesn't change, but the output changes. So this function is not pure. It's not pure because this function for the same input produces each time, each second, a different output. Let's talk about arithmetical uh, calculations. So we have a function which multiplies two things. And again, this function doesn't communicate with the, out the world outside of, of this function. It, there is no effects except multiplying those two parameters that are passed in to this function, which means that this function is pure. We can replace the invocation of this function with the result as well. We'll talk about it in a moment. Another example is built-in array operations in JavaScript. So we have two functions. One is slice and another one is splice. And those functions do the same thing. They slice your array. But one of them is pure. Slice is pure. Because if you have an, an array and if you do slice, for example, from two to, to five. You can call this function many times and it will always return the same result. So for the same input, it will always generate the same output and there is no side effects, no observable uh, changes in the system besides returning a slice of your array. But splice is different. Splice is different because it mutates the array which is passed on which the splice method is invoked. So if we invoke it once, it will return the, the same result as slice. But if we invoke it many times with the same parameters, the output will be different. 
because each time the array will be mutated and the new array will be smaller than the previous one. Because splice mutates the array, which is used as a source of this operation, it's not pure. So now let's talk about mathematical functions. So the observation is that, so if you say function in mathematical sense, this function is always pure. There is no such thing as pure and unpure functions in mathematics. When we have a function in mathematics, it means it's pure. In programming, if you are naming a function, if you are saying that this function is pure function, you can also say that this function is a function in mathematical sense. Which means that such functions aren't really lists of steps, lists list of instructions to execute. And mathematical functions don't really communicate with the external world. They transform something, they are relations. So whatever happens, they are always pure. Why we call certain functions pure and other functions unpure? And there is some history behind that. This distinction pure and impure comes probably from Lisp. The design of Lisp is based on functional programming. And because everything is a function, and because Lisp allows you only to define a function, it means that you have to distinguish between functions which do side effects and, function, and functions which don't do side effects. And they decided to call the functions which do side effects impure. As a consequence, the others are pure. In Lisp, you only have functions and there is no, there, there is no notion of procedures. Uh, procedures are a list of steps. So a procedure is something that can execute a list of steps and it doesn't have to return an output. And function always have to return an output. And there is an interesting history behind that. So for example, in languages like, um, like C or similar, you can say void and name of a function, which really is procedure because it's something which you, you define but you explicitly state that the output there is no output of this function so what are benefits of pure functions so the first and most important one is it's easier to reason about pure functions pure functions don't have side effects they only influence the behavior of the program through their output. Their output is the only thing. They do some computation and the output is the only thing they can do. Uh, they cannot print something to the console in addition to doing the kind of computations. The output for a pure function is the only way to communicate with the external world. This output of a pure function is deterministic. For the same input, it generates the same output. And determinism is very important in computer science because Imagine you have a sorting algorithm and if you have a, a list of elements which is unsorted, you want to have a deterministic way of changing this unsorted list into a sorted one. So you, you want to have a method which always produces a sorted list from an unsorted ones. And because pure functions, because the output of pure functions is deterministic, in other words, it only depends on the input. This means that pure functions, you could say by definition, preserve referential transparency we talked about in the previous episode. The pure functions are referentially transparent and an expression which is referentially transparent is also pure. Another benefit of using pure functions is that they are uh, explicit. You define the dependencies of, the, of a function, the input parameters are the only dependencies. Everything that happens is only the output, as we said, which means they are explicit. They are almost, we could say, transparent, almost like values to some extent. And we will see how it later on, how it can help us. Pure functions are self-contained. They don't need anything else. They don't need to communicate with the external world. They are independent. They are transparent, self-contained. They are defined in an explicit way. There is no, nothing hidden inside them. And as we learn through this course, using pure functions can lead to a more performant code. And I will show you at the end of this episode a very short example of that. But we will explore this idea of increasing performance through functional programming using pure functions and techniques based on that through this course. Let's combine it with what we learned in the previous episode. So 
Previously, we talked about this property, this characteristic for expressions, which is called preferential transparency. So let's let's try to combine that. So if we have a function and this function it doesn't have side effects, this is not necessary for our functions to be pure. On top of that, this function needs to generate the same output for the same input, which is the definition for referential transparency. So for example, there was uh, this code that generated the, the date. The input doesn't change, but the output each time I invoke this function is different. So this is not referentially transparent, this expression, which means that if we put this expression into a function and we invoke this function, it's not referentially transparent, it won't be pure, despite the fact that there is no, there are no side effects. And because pure functions are referentially transparent and we can define one thing using the another, this means that whenever you are calling a pure function, you can always replace this call, this invocation, by the output. So if an expression is referentially transparent, it means it's deterministic. It means that the expression can be replaced by its, its value. You can evaluate that and replace for an expression which is referentially transparent. It's deterministic and we have no side effects. This means that the expression is, is pure. Finally, let's quickly look at the pure programming language you already know from a very early ages, I assume. And this language is the language of arithmetical expressions. So here we have a computation. We are adding two numbers. Then we are multiplying another sum, multiplying another sum. The steps I uh, showed you here is how we could calculate that. So we just take the first parentheses, we calculate. Then we go to the second and we calculate. And the third and we calculate. And then we multiply and multiply again. This is the moment where we can define a function in a slightly different way. So instead of defining it as a unit of computation, we can say that this is the ev evaluation we are talking about. It's about rewriting certain expressions with values. So for example, we are rewriting or replacing 1 plus 7 by 8. We are replacing 2 plus 4 with 6 and 4 plus 3 with 7. And these are these are functions. We can you can imagine that you could uh, we are using the plus function here and the multiplication and the addition functions here. And instead of looking at it as a computation, we are looking at it as a replacement, as a rewriting using some rules we already know from early school. There is another interesting thing that happens here, that. If we, let's say, I would like to compute it in a more traditional sense, imperative sense. So I would, let's say those computation, they mean something. So for example, the first one is the width, the second one is the height, and the, the third one is the depth. And we first add them and then we multiply them. So as you can see, I first execute the, the, this line, then this line and this line. But in fact, if we go back here, I could execute everything in parentheses at the same time. If I have more than one core, I could put each of those calculations on the cores and they could happen in parallel. There is some interesting uh, things going on here that we can speed up this program by almost three times just by doing some calculations in parallel, which is not very straightforward using a traditional programming where we define step step by step because here even if we have a smart compiler it's not really we are not really sure if we can change the order or not so side effects and pure functions that's all for today see you next time